Welcome to this special live stream. Um, it's so great to have everyone with us. We know there was a little bit of a lag time before we started. Uh, we just wanted to wait for enough people to get on and hop onto this great topic. As you've seen um, through our posts, today is um, International Kidney Awareness Day. And it's so great to have all of you with us, but even more exciting, we have the honor of sharing this platform with none other than Dr. David Anwan. Dr. Anwan, thank you so much for making yourself available for the session today. You're so welcome. Um, for those of you who are already aware, um, Dr. David Anwan doesn't necessarily need any introduction, um, but I am going to go ahead anyway. Dr. Anwan is an award-winning general practitioner best known for pioneering the low carb approach in the UK. He's won multiple awards, one of them being the prestigious NHS Innovator of the Year Award for his phenomenal work with diabetes patients. Um, Dr. Anwen is also well known for um, writing several peer reviewed papers to strengthen science behind low carb diets. And he continues to be a trailblazer blaz in LCHF science and research. We have the privilege of having Dr. Anwan here with us today for um, Kidney Awareness Day, World Kidney Awareness Day. Um, but more than that, we also have Dr. Anwan as one of our key speakers at this year's second annual World Nutrition Summit coming to you on the 24th to the 26th of March this year. We're really excited by our speaker lineup. Um, for those of you who have already seen, you have to agree it's a star-studded lineup, but Dr. Anwan is one of them. All coming from different backgrounds, different perspectives with the goal to address global health and nutrition. There, Dr. Anwan will be talking about renal health as well, protein and renal health. So we're really excited to dive into um, his topic. Today, he's going to give us a bit of a sneak peek into that, um, but we're going to keep the juicy bits for the World Nutrition Summit. So without further ado, I'd love to hand over to Dr. Anwen. Um, we will be taking questions at the end of the session. So if you have any questions, I encourage you to please put them in the comment section and we'll do our very best to have them answered um, after Dr. Anwen has finished his presentation. So without further ado, Dr. Anwen, thank you so much. Thank you for that kind introduction. So hello and welcome to everyone. So I'm speaking to you from the west coast of England, right by the sea. It's early spring. You'll see there are daffodils and hyacinths behind me, because I dare say in your part of the country, it may not be the same season even. So um, I'm obsessed with helping my patients improve their health by using lifestyle and not drugs. And you're going to hear about that. First of all, kidney matters. Well, why do we have to have uh, a day to think about the fact that our kidneys matter? And I think the answer is, I find medicine is largely obsessed with the heart and cardiovascular health. And um, all sorts of other organs matter just as much in that, yes, I, I completely see that without a heart, you'd be dead pretty soon, but you'd be dead without your liver pretty soon. You'd also be dead without your kidneys. And I don't think we reflect very much or very often about kidney health. And that's why I volunteered to do this. Uh, so what are we going to cover? Well, the first thing we're going to do is some of you may never have heard of me. And so I'm going to do a little recap on what I've been doing over the last few years and um, how I came to be interested in the low carb approach uh, to chronic disease. So a little recap. Then we're going to be thinking about dietary carbohydrate and protein, a little word about sarcopenia, uh, some interesting uh, discoveries I made about low carb and salt, sodium, and also uh, blood pressure. So we've got quite a lot to be uh, cracking on with. So yes, I'm a, a Royal College of General Practitioners, clinical expert in diabetes, conflicts of interest. Well, um, if anybody ever does pay me for this kind of work, uh, although I'm not being paid today, I donate 100% of that money uh, to one of two favourite British charities. So in that way, I hope I'm not uh, badly conflicted, although I will have to admit there is a bias 
I've been uh, keto, low carb for nine years now and have personally experienced great improvements in my health. And I suppose that may make me biased. If any of you are interested to follow me on Twitter, I'd love that. That's uh, low carb GP. So the first thing on the agenda was a bit of a, um, a recap. So let's do that now. Right. So I want you to uh, meet this uh, this this young man. And uh, what you've got there, uh, he's called Dan. There he is. He's he's 40 years old. Now, uh, the hemoglobin A1C is the blood test we do, uh, which shows how sugary is Dan's blood. And uh, sometime, I think uh, just over a year ago, his hemoglobin A1C was 95. Uh, this is in millimoles per mole. That is sky high, absolutely sky high. And um, uh, it's equivalent in percentages 10.8. Now, clearly we did something right because you'll see that after a 10 minute appointment with me, he has achieved drug-free type two diabetes remission, which is sustained. So his hemoglobin A1C now is 35. So that's a dramatic improvement. His life is transformed. He's also, he was on uh, a high dose of medication for his blood pressure, which uh, he doesn't need anymore. And if we look, there he is now, totally transformed. So in my practice, we've now got, I saw the 112th patient like Dan, two days ago. So we've achieved something like this for 112 patients. Uh, so I hope you're interested to find out how we do this. Why is it important? Well, uh, we know that for people with poorly controlled diabetes, that is people with a hemoglobin A1C of greater than 58 millimoles per mole, they are using around 100 life days for every year that that goes on. So if we had left Dan with his hemoglobin A1C of 95, it was shortening his life. So the point is really having sugary blood seems to be linked to uh, increased mortality. It's actually aging. Uh, so my work is to help people avoid sugary blood. I'm not alone. This is the entire team. So there are actually... Uh, nine doctors in the practice, nurses, receptionists, and it's true to say that most of them are actually low carb now. So this, we're not going to get into detail, but what I'm doing with patients is I'm saying, so a high hemoglobin A1C shows that your average sugariness of your blood is up. And I try and encourage my patients to see this as a puzzle and rather than a problem, because it's much more positive. You see it as a puzzle, uh, a puzzle that my patients and I solve together. Less negative than just telling them they're a problem. Generally, a high blood sugar is something you ate. I'd say 90 to 95 percent of all the high blood sugars I see, it's something that somebody ate in the preceding few hours. I agree sometimes it's stress and sometimes it's drugs like prednisolone. But majorly, your, your blood sugar is high because you ate something. I encourage my patients to ask, where is the sugar in their diet coming from? Um, I just told you I had 112 patients in drug-free remission. For the first 25 years of medicine, I didn't see drug-free remission a single time, not once in 25 years. And now I've seen it 112 times in the last 10 years. Mainly that's because I failed to see how much sugar is present in starchy foods like bread, potatoes, and breakfast cereals. Because of course, uh, starch is glucose molecules holding hands and digestion comes along and breaks it back down into sugar again. Uh, and there's a surprising amount of sugar uh, in bread, potatoes, boiled rice. 
you don't have to uh, copy this down. It's just to show this is a simple A4 diet sheet. This is the diet sheet that we've been using at Norwood Avenue, my practice uh, since 2013. Um, it's been replicated all over the internet. It's not uh, copyrighted. Uh, a shorthand would be to turn the white stuff green. So keep your protein up or increase the protein. But the white stuff like bread, pasta, rice, breakfast cereals, have green food instead and also increase healthy fats. Uh, something that I'll be coming back to later was in the very early days, I personally discovered I needed to increase salt in the diet on a low carb. I didn't know why that was, but if I didn't, I had terrible muscle cramps. And actually my blood pressure uh, became too low so that if I stood up quickly, I felt dizzy, but we'll be coming back to that later. Um, just to finish off this intro, um, so this is data from March 2017 to 2021. And you can see here in this column, the cases of remission of diabetes are going up year on year. So that finished, that was, I think, last October. It was 105. It should be 112 now. So the remission rate at Norwood Avenue for people who choose to try the low-carb approach is 52%. So 52% of all the people who try low carb at Norwood Avenue achieve um, a non-diabetic blood sugar without drugs. What's interesting is we have the remission rate for the entire practice. So we're a practice of nine and a half thousand patients. Uh, not everybody tries uh, low carb, but 22% of everybody with type two diabetes at Norwood Avenue now has a remission of their diabetes. And this is reflected in medication drug budget savings. So we're, we're saving about £62,000 per year on drugs for diabetes alone. But let's get on to the kidneys. So uh, this worried me. Uh, I saw the headline, high protein diet could be harmful even for healthy kidneys. This was in Medsta Medscape, November 2019 by Pam Harrison. And she's saying, a high protein diet often recommended as a way to lose weight and stay healthy appears to be harmful to the kidneys in individuals with apparently normal kidney function. So I have to say that headline um, was a concern for me. And then there was worse uh, because um, also November 2019, uh, Professor Fouke, a past chair of the European Renal Nutrition Working Group, uh, published a paper and he said, a high protein diet induces glomerular hyperfiltration. And he felt that this may boost a pre-existing low-grade chronic kidney disease, often prevalent in people with diabetes, may even increase the risk of de novo kidney disease. So these headlines are very worrying uh, for doctors like me because uh, on the whole, I'm promoting people have more protein, not less. Um, it's true to say, actually, though, there is a balance. And this paper is, is about the double-edged sword of uh, dietary protein. So actually, sarcopenia is clinically quite a problem. And certainly, uh, we know that 41% of patients with moderate chronic kidney disease have sarcopenia already. But then on the other hand, what if increasing protein intake caused kidney failure? So here's a paper worrying that, well, on one hand, reducing protein might help the kidneys, but on the other hand, it might affect the incidence of sarcopenia. So it's not as simple as just cutting protein. Sarcopenia, does it matter? Well, it certainly does. So sarcopenia is associated with increased uh, falls, functional decline, frailty, and actual mortality. And there's the reference for you there. So, um, grip strength, which is part of muscle bulk, is a long-term predictor of mortality from all causes, cardiovascular and cancer, 
in men. And there's the reference. So I think that sarcopenia in older people, I think in clinical practice, it's a real problem. And so the idea of cutting back on protein uh, makes me anxious, particularly as dietary protein really does help people with, uh, with appetite. So just something now on um, kidney disease itself. So we know that mortality rates for those with nephropathy are very high, increasing from 1.4% per year if you uh, have normo albuminuria, so you're not producing protein in the, ear, in the urine, to 4.6 per year for people with proteinuria. And people with renal impairment have um, a mortality rate of 19.2%. So this is all a bit stressy really, isn't it? Because we know that kidneys matter. Uh, uh, we're worrying about sarcopenia and protein in the diet. So how do we resolve all these things uh, to the benefit of our patients? Um, so just coming back to the low carb thing, of course, if you are on a low carb diet, as so many hundreds of my patients are, instead of the carbohydrate, you've only got two alternatives. There are only three macronutrients, carbohydrate, protein, and fat. So if you're low carb, then uh, one of your options is to increase dietary fats. Trouble with that is it's historically been attributed to worsening lipid profiles and cardiovascular disease. Or you can increase dietary protein. Certainly that helps with satiety and it's a great for weight loss. But if these fears about dietary protein and renal function are correct, are we helping our patients? Well, um, so I began to look out for individual N equals one cases. And here is uh, somebody who had such poor renal function and also terrible diabetic control um, that we couldn't use metformin. So at this point over here on the left, we started insulin for this patient. Um, but then uh, they gained weight and didn't feel that was helpful. So we instituted a low carb approach, cutting back on sugar and starchy carbs. And as you see, in the end, kidney function was normal. And that patient was off insulin, off glycoside, off doxazosin with a normal renal function and uh, an absolutely normal blood pressure. So that we couldn't say for that person that cutting the carbohydrates did anything other than help renal function and many other uh, important markers. But that's only an N equals one. Uh, here's another one. So this is somebody that's been on a low carb diet uh, for nine years. And we're looking here at the urinary albumin creatinine ratio. So there was significant proteinuria here and uh, a poor control of diabetes. This person has been in remission of diabetes for years, as you see on the top graph, the hemoglobin A1C, and the lower graph, I'm glad to say, uh, the enormous improvements in uh, urinary albumin, urinary protein. So that's two just anecdotes, N equals one. Um, another thing that happened, I was giving an, a talk, an international talk in Ireland, actually, and a very senior dietitian got up and said, you know, uh, she was pleased to see that I was helping people with diabetes, but why wasn't I worried about renal function? And I went home and this is my wife, Jen. And she said, well, if you're worrying, why don't you do something about this? Why don't you drill back down into the data at Norwood Avenue and actually find out? Because although I hadn't been recording renal function, it was perfectly accessible to me in the um, computer system uh, that we have in the practice. So we looked at renal function uh, for 143 people who'd been on a low carb diet for about two and a half years. And the point is that these are people aged over 60 with diabetes. So you would expect uh, for older people with diabetes to show significant deterioration in kidney function over two and a half years. So 
uh, this is the reference uh, for the paper. It was published last July. And um, th these are the statistics. So there's baseline and then latest follow-up and the difference. So the weight on average improved by 9.5 kilos. The sugariness of the blood uh, improved from a hemoglobin A1C of 65 down to 47. So that was highly significant. The good news is, so first of all, if you increase protein, does that ruin kidney function? Well, there were significant improvements in all measures of renal function for this cohort. So that was creatinine, EGFR, or in urinary ACR. So they're all there, all of them improved. How reassuring. We also looked at the lipid profile. So what if what with all the eggs and uh, full fat dairy and um, fatty meat? Well, also the lipid profiles improve significantly. And then if we just look under there, you can see the blood pressure also improves significantly. So I was really reassured uh, by this, that my patients did not seem to be uh, coming to harm by going on a low carb diet. This is the, uh, this is the paper, it's open access. You can uh, Google it. Uh, if you just Google renal, function and unwind that'll get you to the paper open access uh, christopher wong uh, is a professor of nephrology at liverpool university and nicola guess is a very senior uh, dietitian in uh, london uh, so the results of that were very very encouraging so let's just have a look at some of the results so this is creatinine uh, so the serum creatinine in this case for 132 people for an average of 32 months. And you can see that 67% of those individuals had an improved creatinine. A few had no change and some got worse. The average improvement is there. If we look at the estimated glomerulo filtration rate, this is the EGFR. Remember that with renal aging, you would expect this to worsen by a, um, a figure of one uh, for every year. So over 30 months, you would expect the EGFR to be reduced or down by 2.5. But this is what happened amazingly, exactly the opposite happened. So we got average improvements in EGFR. Um, completely the opposite of what renal aging would have predicted. So that's very reassuring. Just to show you what happened in terms of sugariness um, on this, the great majority of the people got improved diabetic control. Only 3% showed a worsening uh, type 2 diabetes control. I think that's absolutely astonishing. And if you had a medication, that could do anything like that, my goodness, you'd be making money. So that is something there on renal function, low carb. Uh, but just going back, I hope you're intrigued uh, about the improvements in blood pressure. So we're getting significant improvements in blood pressure when people go low carb. I didn't initially expect that. Uh, I saw it in patients and I didn't understand what was going on. So here's a um, a case. This guy was measuring his blood pressure at home, and you can see his average there was about 169 over 98. This was November 2019. By September 2021, I've got he was on all those medications. I deprescribed all those medications. His diabetes was in remission. And you see here the blood pressure is so much better. Uh, you can see figures there of 104 over 75, 111 over 80, completely different. So how intriguing. Why is it that blood pressure improves when you go low carb? The other thing is, do you know, do you remember from earlier on, I was saying to you that uh, people who go low carb need more salt. And certainly if you don't, you find you get muscle cramps. I'm quite a keen runner. And I was really forced to add more salt to the diet. Otherwise, I got significant 
uh, muscle cramps. And we noticed this with so many of our patients, I became quite intrigued. Why is it uh, that people who are low carb need more salt? And why is it that their blood pressure doesn't go up? How intriguing. And we replicated this time and time again. How very interesting. And then there was another thing we noticed. So this, uh, this lady had been having a high dose of fruzamide to control her severe ankle edema for 14 years. Uh, she presented with uh, poor diabetic control up here. She went low carb and her diabetic control really improved. But this is a photo of her ankles and she sent me this because they're not swollen. Her ankles didn't normally look anything like that. She was so proud she sent me a photo and she'd come off her fruzamide. And I find that lots of patients lose fluid when they go low carb, significant amounts of fluid. I've had people lose five kilos in a week. I can't possibly be fat. Most of it is uh, water. I've had two cases of really severe heart failure where low carb has been an effective treatment for those people because they've passed so much urine. So how fascinating, three things. Low carb results in uh, you needing more salt. Low carb results in improvements in blood pressure. Low carb uh, results in water loss. So how might these be linked? And it took me years to drill down into this absolutely years to find out what is it that links these things. And really the first thing that astonished me was we've known since 1933 uh, that renal function, the kidney function, is affected by insulin. And that in fact insulin causes your kidneys to hoard sodium and also water. So in this uh, study, um, if you withdrew insulin, um, they started weighing more and losing sodium. And when you restarted the insulin, uh, there was a, the diuresis stopped and they started hoarding sodium. And this has been known perfectly well since 1933. I was so astonished by that. And here's another study. Insulin infusions in euglycemic human subjects significantly decreased urinary sodium excretion. So here we have a thing that if, if insulin affects sodium excretion, a high carb diet is a high insulin diet and you start hoarding sodium and also fluid. So there's fluid retention which, and sodium retention, which together put up your blood pressure. Um, uh, finally, finally, here's a good study, glycemic index, glycemic load and blood pressure, a systemic review and meta-analysis of RCTs. And it says here, a lower glycemic diet may lead to important reductions in blood pressure. It's exactly what I've found. And so this is so, I think, important. We never think about it. We never talk about it. But this is the link between renal function and diet. So a high carb diet is a high insulin diet and insulin can cause you to retain sodium. And of course, God designed us to have homeostasis for sodium so that you eat salty foods and you get rid of the sodium. We weren't designed to die on a high salt diet, but if you have a high salt diet and a high carb diet, then you're in trouble because you're hoarding that salt. And I often say we blame the wrong crystal, because if you give up the sugar, you can eat the salt probably uh, without any problem. Uh, we did an open access paper on this with a, a professor, Professor Brady, a professor of cardiology at uh, Glasgow University. And here is the again, uh, the average systolic. It was 143 to start, went down to 132. The diastolic went 84 to 78. These are averages. And this is with us deprescribing 20% of all the drugs for high blood pressure these people were taking. This has been an incredibly popular 
paper. It's in the top 1% of all papers ever published, of which there are 20 million. So it's causing, this paper is causing uh, great interest and its altmetric score has risen since I did this slide. So again, open access, you can Google Unwin and blood pressure. I really hope you're interested in that paper. And uh, here we are. Uh, since I published my paper more recently, the American Diabetes Association has published uh, a paper. A high to normal protein intake is not associated with faster renal function deterioration in patients with type 2 diabetes. Hooray! Hooray! Um, so we can stop worrying uh, for most patients um, about protein intake in my own clinical practice if the um if the patients have normal renal function i'm not worrying at all about protein and if they have a slightly uh, reduced renal function i'm just monitoring it and i suggest that's what you do as well monitor it and see what happens um and there's the detail of that um uh uh, study just giving you the facts there so in fact here for people with a reduced intake of uh, dietary protein they had an increased hazard for renal function deterioration exactly the opposite to what i was uh, i thought was true So the conclusion in patients with type 2 diabetes, unrestricted dietary protein was not associated with an increased hazard of renal function deterioration. So substituting carbohydrates with dietary protein is not contraindicated as part of diabetes management. I can't emphasize this paper enough. It's really, really important. And it means we're all, we are safe, as it were. It's been thought of, thought out and looked at. So what about the professor who said a high protein diet induces glomerular hyperfiltration, boosting diabetic kidney disease? How on earth did we get this so wrong for so long? And that's the subject of my presentation to the second annual World uh, Nutrition Subject uh, Summit in a few weeks time, because I was so uh, fascinated and then annoyed that I'd been saying the wrong thing, that I, I did a deep dive into actually, why did that professor say that and what? What was the quality of the evidence he was using? So I hope you're intrigued to know why it is that we think of a high protein diet as being bad for kidneys. Uh, just coming towards the end now, we've made big progress in the UK. Uh, so that the British Dietetics Association have worked with me. And in fact, they invited this review published last July. So they, um, they provided five senior dietitians and five clinicians, and we looked at dietary strategies for remission of type 2 diabetes. And uh, this was published in the British Dietetics Association own journal. So it's respectably done. And the conclusion was type 2 diabetes remission should be considered as a, uh, a treatment goal for people living with type 2 diabetes. And it should be positively discussed. Total dietary replacements, uh, which is the shakes and low carb diets have been demonstrated as being effective in facilitating weight loss and remission of diabetes. Finally, Total dietary replacement and low carb diets, if appropriately supported, are considered safe. Final word, they're considered safe and we should be using them as part of good management of type 2 diabetes. So again, this is another open access paper. Um, and if uh, you find people uh, disagree with you about low carb, uh, some of these papers could support you very well uh, if patients are interested in uh, trying a low carb approach. Free stuff. So if you Google PHC unwin sugar, I told you at the beginning, I donate any income, uh, spare income from doing this work to a British charity. It's called the PHC. 
and it's full of free non-copyrighted material that you can download. So there's low carb booklets, there's the diet sheet, protocols for nurses and doctors, there are my sugar infographics, I think in 14 languages now, and a lot more. So think about the public health collaboration. Uh, we've set it up to help you. We've come to the end. One last patient. I like everything to be uh, patient centered. This is, is Brian. He's 83 years old. And I'm holding the tape measure where Brian's tummy was when he first met me. And he was on insulin and had very poor health. Brian has completely changed his life. He's off insulin. He's off all drugs. His blood pressure is now normal and he's not taking drugs for blood pressure. Uh, totally changed. And uh, recently was late for an appointment. And that's because he was at the gym. He's often at the gym. So if Brian, aged 83, can do this, I think many of your patients can do it as well. So a low carbohydrate diet, despite possibly increasing the protein, the protein, if appropriately supported, is considered safe and can improve renal function and diabetic control. Also, a low carb, low insulin diet can help blood pressure control. Uh, so that's my take really on the low carb and renal side of things with more to come in a few weeks uh, when I'll be revealing a bit more. I hope that was of interest and I hope you've got some questions. Dr. Anand, thank you so, so much. That was such a brilliant presentation and thank I'm you. so excited. I cannot wait to take a deep dive into your content for the World Nutrition Summit. Um, there is a question we've got from Sophie Gironi. She says, um, when it comes to high protein, this is often misleading for common people. Nowadays, eating meat every day is considered as high protein, while for me, it's normal intake. Could you please let us know what you consider in grams and appropriate daily protein intake? How interesting. That's a, a really great question. Uh, and it, it, if you look at the time frame, uh, what we think of normal is normal for now. But if we go back to uh, Caveman, he was probably eating, in fact, we know he was eating, if he could get it, he was eating mainly meat. And so relative to our ancestors, what we're eating now is a reasonably low protein diet. So things have um, changed a lot. What I'm trying to do with my patients on the whole is not get them to weigh food at all, because I think normal life is about eating what you know to be healthy food and not weighing it and not weighing it. And also, uh, so for me, I'm, um, I'm comfortable with patients majoring the diet on protein. So I would start the diet with fish, meat, chicken or maybe cheese or eggs and then I'm adding in healthy green veg to that and so that um, rather than my patients thinking about grams of uh, protein they I'm teaching them uh, how what the plate should look like and uh, I don't want them to weigh things now the I think the recommended protein was something like 0.8 grams per kilo so I would happily double that. I would happily uh, double that and not worry. And for anybody that is worried, you, that's what I've done in my practice. I've measured renal function now, liver function, blood pressure, lipid profiles, and then you're getting feedback. And then I've had many, many pleasant surprises where things have improved. So many of the, so many of what I thought to be sensible advice for the first 25 years as a GP have turned out to be dogma and not really supported. And it's no wonder that I ended up prescribing more and more drugs because my approach was deeply flawed. And, and since I've really thought about the causes of illness, what is the cause of chronic illness? Um, I'm coming to some very different uh, solutions and diet can make a, a, a huge difference. So that's my slightly convoluted answer that to that question. 
Thank you so much, Dr. Anwen. Thank you so much, Sophie. I hope you found that helpful. Um, I think that's the only question we have at this time. Fine. Um, as mentioned, if you want to take a deep dive and join Dr. Anwan in unpacking this remarkable, remarkable topic, please join us at this year's second annual World Nutrition Summit, 24 to 26 March. Um, details are in the description. Um, ticket sales are still open. This will be a virtual summit. So um, we have a star-studded speaker lineup all coming to you at the click of a button. We're bringing them all to you under one virtual platform with both Dr. David and um, Dr. Jen Unwin. So very, very excited to have I was going to say thank you for giving my wife. So just a quick word about why Jen is so interesting. So she's passionate. Why can't people cut back on carbohydrates easily? Why don't they, you know, it's simple. Why don't they just do it? Uh, she's a consultant health psychologist. And in her practice, she believes that food addiction is why intelligent people struggle to do something so simple as cut back on bread. And that's what she'd like to talk to you about. And she's more, far more interesting than me. Watch Jen instead. <laughs> we cannot wait to have the both of you um, at the World Nutrition Summit. Again, Dr. Anwan, thank you so much for your contributions. Thank you so much for making yourself available. And we really, really look forward to connecting with you and our audience um, from the 24th to the 26th of March. Thank you all for watching and we'll see you soon. Goodbye. Very, thank very you. welcome. Bye-bye.